Welcome, everyone, to our Thursday night digital discussion. We've got a great talk coming up tonight about the uh, mansions of Prospect Avenue uh, with the architectural historian John Eastberg uh, coming up here in just a couple minutes. Um, I'm going to just tell you what's kind of going on with the Milwaukee County Historical Society here. Um, my name is John Harry. I'm the Programs and Marketing Fellow for the Historical Society. We're doing this presentation tonight uh, with our friends at the Pabst Mansion. Um, happy to be uh, supporting Milwaukee history along with uh, their great organization as well. Um, some things going on with the Historical Society. Uh, this is pretty big is that we are open right now. Um, holy cow, right? Um, so masks are required. We are a county uh, facility, although it sounds like the way things are going, it might be required everywhere anyway. Um, but uh, we are taking all the safety precautions. If you want to come in and enjoy our exhibits, we still have most of our exhibit up from the spring called Revealed, Milwaukee's Unseen Treasures. So part of that is like the Goldman's counter, if you didn't get in to see that, um, part of the plane wreckage from uh, the plane that uh, Fred C. Miller died in. Those are just some of the highlights. Uh, Liberace's performance jacket. That's pretty cool too. Um, that's that's in the uh, the museum uh, too. So uh, we've got that going on right now. Plus uh, our summer exhibit uh, is very topical to do with uh, the election coming up. You might've heard, uh, but uh, uh, better, bigger, brighter, 150 years of Milwaukee politics. So delving all into uh, Milwaukee's political history, we have that on display through the elections in November um, at the historical society. So milwaukeehistory.net, if you want any information on that. Um, also just want to let you know, uh, speaking of architecture, one of the oldest homes in Milwaukee, I believe it's one of the oldest still standing actually is the Kilbourne townhouse in Estabrook park. Uh, that is open for self-guided tours starting on Sunday. So Sundays, while well, the farmer's market is going on there, uh, you can uh, go through Kilbourne townhouse, uh, between 10 30 and 1 PM on Sundays, all the way through September. Um, so if you have any, again, if you have any questions on that, you can hit us up on Facebook or go to milwaukeehistory.net. There's my spiel. We have our, uh, hordes of John Eastberg, John Eastberg fans <laughs> here waiting, um, which we're really excited about tonight. So if you, uh, what is, God, when was that John that, uh, you did the grand Avenue? Was that, that was like, that was like middle of the early April. Pandemic. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That, that was when like, what is all this right now? This has become a regular thing. <laughs> Um, so John did a great presentation about the mansions at Grand Avenue, and it was one of the most popular programs that we've done. And we thought, well, what else do you got, John? And he goes, well, we'll do the other really cool street. Of I've got another street for you. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, uh, so we have tonight, uh, Prospect Avenue and the, the architectural mar marvels and the families who live there and John's going to talk all about it. So, uh, with that, uh, John Eastberg, Milwaukee architectural historian, you get to take it away. Thanks so much, John. Well, it's great to be with all of you again and on this uh, stormy night. And I was telling John that uh, the first time I ever gave this talk was a very stormy night as well. So I don't know what it is about Prospect Avenue, but uh, I'm so glad you're all with us uh, tonight. And let's get started. So this is from an early Stereopticon card uh, from 1874 and taken from, believe it or not, the roof of Emanuel Presbyterian Church on Astor Street, looking north. Uh, so you're looking across the Judge Jason Downer house is kind of on the corner uh, of Prospect. Prospect is that angled street running um, all the way up. And way in the distance, you can see um, the water tower uh, for the um, for the pumping station uh, in the distance, and the little building next to it is uh, the first uh, St. Mary's Hospital. So, in some ways, very little has changed in this part of town, and yet so many things have changed. Uh, when I was preparing for this particular talk, I was looking at this photograph and thinking. Uh, so many of these homes uh, that are kind of in the foreground and going up the street were all kind of the first generation of homes. And so what we'll really be looking at today was the second generation of homes. I think that's really kind of an interesting uh, point to think about when you're, you're looking at these things. We always think that these 1880s, 1890s mansions were kind of the first homes on this street, but actually there was a whole other 1850s, 1860s uh, generation of homes that were there, torn down to make way for those. And then a lot of the homes that we're gonna be seeing were torn down for apartment buildings. So it really, 
a city is a changing organic thing and very few things actually stay the same. So, but um, with that in mind, we're gonna start uh, on the corner of Juno and uh, Prospect Avenue and we're gonna head north. And for context, the even numbers are the lake side and the um, odd numbers are the inland side of Prospect. And we'll kind of, I'll, I'll we'll toggle back and forth uh, down the street. And uh, so that just kind of gives you some context. But I always think of the Judge Jason Downer house as kind of the, the gateway to Prospect Avenue. And um, it's a really important house. It has stayed uh, amazingly intact uh, on that corner uh, since uh, 1874. And again, this is a very early photograph it, uh, of the house. And Judge Jason Downer was always kind of considered uh, a lawyer's lawyer. He was kind of a brilliant legal mind. He was very interested in um, uh, women's education. Actually, uh, Wisconsin Female College uh, changed their name in 1889 uh, to Downer College. And so uh, in recognition of his benefaction of their institution, but also his interest in uh, women's mm -hmm. education. So uh, he lived in this house and uh, until uh, his death in 1883. And uh, his wife was in the house for another five years. And then as part of her will, uh, they left um, the house uh, to Emanuel Presbyterian Church in order uh, to become the Downer home uh, for retired and fatigued ministers and their wives, which I've always liked the fatigued ministers and their wives because it is always a, a, a joint project when a minister and his wife are completely fatigued and they need uh, to rest. And amazingly, that house uh, was a retirement home all the way until uh, the mid 1960s. So in 1965, the Downer Estate uh, finally sold uh, the house um, through the church and uh, it became offices and um, uh, until uh, the 21st century. And so here we have it uh, before it went through a huge restoration it was purchased um, shortly uh, in, uh, after the turn of the 21st century by Dan Wilhelms, who uh, is a great enthusiast of historic architecture. He owns two properties on, um, on Prospect. And so went th he went through a lengthy restoration uh, of the Downer House. And uh, one of the first things they did were stripping the, the front doors of the house and really revealing all the beautiful carvings uh, and the woodwork. And then taking the years of paint uh, off the house as well and kind of restoring it back to its beautiful Cream City brick uh, um, um, color. And so you actually gave us an opportunity to see what the house looked like uh, in 1874. Because there were really good uh, period photographs of the house, uh, architectural historian Russell Zimmerman uh, was able to uh, recreates uh, the design of the French porch, which was put back exactly the way it was in the 1870s. So it was really exciting to actually see something come back so authentically uh, as the Downer House. Now, it's technically not Prospect Avenue, but I do want to mention uh, the house next door because they've been sitting next to each other since 1886. And so this is the George and Laura Miller House. Uh, Laura Miller, uh, who was actually Laura Chapman, uh, was the youngest daughter of T.A. Chapman, Milwaukee's just department store uh, prince. And as a wedding present, he had uh, this house built uh, for Laura and uh, her husband. And it was designed by a Chicago architect, uh, August Fiedler. And uh, it was remodeled once around the turn of the century. And uh, the person who did the remodeling uh, was Lewis Comfort Tiffany uh, and the Tiffany Studios. Chapman's was uh, the retailer for uh, Tiffany Studios uh, in Milwaukee. So there was definitely a connection uh, with that. So 
uh, some beautiful stained glass windows uh, by Tiffany were added uh, at that time. And uh, it really is a remarkable house. Uh, it's still maintained uh, by descendants uh, of the Millers. And uh, famously, um, Isabel Miller, who was uh, a daughter of George and Laura Miller, was born uh, in uh, uh, the master bedroom of this house and uh, died in that same room uh, with 91 years difference. So she had lived her entire life in that house in the beginning and the end happened in a second floor bedroom of this house. And here's a great photograph of the two homes sitting side by side. And really, you know, you think of them as kind of old friends that have seen a lot of changes on the avenue, but are still uh, splendid examples and really very, very little has changed. So around the corner from the Downer House was a fountain, uh, was the fourth ward, uh, park and fountain and now uh, Burns Commons. Uh, for some reason, uh, uh, Judge Downer loved having one view uh, to the north of the fountain and to the south. He had a beautiful view of the Bay of Milwaukee. And um, a gentleman by the name of Francis Hinton decided to build an investment property uh, on uh, Prospect Avenue. Uh, and he built this beautiful double house, but it's built uh, very far forward on that lot. And so it cut out uh, Judge Downer's view of that fountain and he was very upset by this. And so um, in kind of the, the, the uh, dwindling years or the, the kind of the, the end of Downer's life, he decided to, um, to uh, make a reply to what he referred to as the spite house. So the spite house is the double house, which is in the foreground, and the reply house is right next to it. And when I say right next to it, it is literally right next to it. And that was to cut out any chance of a view uh, from uh, Hinton, uh, Hinton's uh, double house. As Russell Zimmerman has said, you couldn't even place a uh, butter knife between those uh, two homes. So it's it's pretty extraordinary. I'm glad that these two homes have survived together because it kind of shows you um, what you could do before building codes. You can really just kind of sidle up to your, your neighbor, whether you liked them or you didn't. So moving over to the, to the lake side, we have uh, the Samuel Marshall residence, and you'll recognize the name Marshall from Marshall and Ilsley. He was one of the founders uh, of the bank uh, in 1847, and he built this 1870s uh, Italianate uh, mansion, which his daughter uh, had remained in uh, that house until the 1920s, uh, when it was uh, finally sold uh, to uh, the gentleman who owned uh, the Milwaukee Journal at the time, Harry Grant. And uh, in 1938, he hired the architect uh, Herbert Tulgren, uh to design this uh, amazing um, apartment building, one of, the, one of the first modern apartment buildings uh, that were built uh, on Prospect Avenue. So you can imagine going from uh, the Marshall House uh, to kind of this, you know, uh, space age uh, apartment building uh, in 1938. It really was a remarkable building. Uh, Detractors, of course, they called it Grant's Tomb because of Harry Grant and because it was this uh, kind of limestone encased uh, structure. But uh, it had eight apartments on each floor and the elevator stopped on every other floor. So it really kind of gave this, this uh, great privacy. The elevators didn't stop uh, on the level of the apartments that actually had the bedrooms. So it was supposed to be a much quieter building. And so this building, uh, originally known as the Exton Apartment Building, or now 1260, uh, is still very much with us. A couple of interesting things about Prospect Avenue, um, and to me, this is kind of an excellent example of, of what true urban history is, is that you have these amazing mansions that are, are being built along uh, Prospect Avenue, 
But uh, beginning in the 1870s, uh, there was the rail bed for the Chicago Northwestern uh, rail line that went uh, running north and south right below all of these mansions. So you had uh, these, you know, 19th century locomotives belching coal smoke all over the backsides uh, of these homes. So you had these beautiful lake views, which had kind of a mixed blessing of being uh, uh, windy and damp, uh, but and you had <laughs> locomotives that had all this coal soot and smoke. But uh, again, the, the lake view was desirable. Sometimes people wanted to be inland, so they moved on to Grand Avenue, or if they wanted the lake views or to be close to the lake, they moved on to uh, Prospect Avenue. So it, uh, on the lake side, uh, there was the Van Dyke uh, double house. And this is another wedding present house, which uh, I always think is kind of fun. Uh, and this particular wedding present house actually came with the uh, benefactor of the house. And so it was built uh, for Mr. and Mrs. Uh, George Douglas Van Dyke uh, uh, and paid for by uh, Judah Lawrence, who was uh, the father of uh, Mrs. Van Dyke, and he inhabited uh, the southern end of the uh, house, or the double house, and they in the northern side. And so I, I've always loved that idea where, where the father-in-law actually comes with the house. And so uh, the Van Dykes held on to this property uh, well into uh, the 20th century. Uh, eventually it was sold, and uh, in the mid-1970s, uh, it was uh, demolished for the Park East Freeway development, which we will talk about in a little bit. So just going, again, uh, just north of there uh, at uh, 1300 Prospect Avenue was the Charles Colby uh, residence, and this was a really beautiful uh, 1880 house designed by uh, Edward Townsend Mix uh, in the Queen, Queen Anne style. And uh, Gustav Papst Jr., who is the business editor for uh, the Milwaukee Journal in the 1930s and 40s, had written a little piece about this house. And he wrote, this house of red brick uh, with black stripes, green porches, white stone, the shingles that came from the giant redwood trees of California, a mess of gables and windows with little panes of blue glass. And it was true, there were uh, actually uh, over 55 stained glass windows uh, that were in this house originally. Uh, Colby sold this house uh, to Patrick Cudahy in 1904. Interestingly, in 1904, Patrick Cudahy had torn down his family home on Grand Avenue, built the Grand Mora apartments uh, on that street, and then went over to Prospect. So it's it's interesting seeing some of these Grand Avenue families leaving Grand Avenue and moving uh, over to, to Prospect. Uh, after Patrick Cudahy's uh, death, it was sold to the, uh, the College Women's uh, Club and remained that. Uh, until the 1960s when, in 1961, the Leighton School of Art uh, purchased it as a dormitory for their uh, female students. And so 54 uh, um, female students from the Leighton School of Art, which you can see in the background of this photograph, uh, made up their home. And I've also, I, you know, I love the contrast to some of these photographs. So you have this 1880s home with a mix of one of Milwaukee's most uh, progressive mid-century uh, buildings, Leighton School of Art, uh, just next door. So this is a great, great photograph. Here's a early, or actually, I should say a late color shot, just kind of giving you a sense of what uh, this home looked like uh, in its original uh, colors. And then this too was demolished in the early 1970s <coughs> for the uh, Park East freeways freeway and eventually um, the Lake Bluff condominiums were built on that site. Excuse me just for one second. <clears throat> so I always say this looks like a Charles Adams cartoon house. You could just see the Adams family uh, living in this particular home. 
but it was a very uh, prominent home on Prospect Avenue, uh, built around 1875. Uh, this was the home of Daniel Wells, and he had made his for fortune in um, uh, rail cars. Uh, he was a rail car builder. And again, his daughter uh, took over this house and she actually went to the Leighton School of Art and had stayed involved with uh, the programming of the Leighton uh, School. And in the 1940s, Leighton was looking to move the school from the basement of the Leighton Art Gallery on Jefferson Street and find a place along uh, Prospect Avenue, along the lake in which to build a new school. So Helena Camp uh, Lane, who was uh, the, one of the daughters of Daniel Wells, or excuse me, granddaughters, uh, said that she would uh, allow for the Leighton School of Arts to be built on that site, but she had to have a lifetime use of an apartment on the top most uh, level of the Leighton um, um, School of Art building. So she went from this Victorian structure to this ultra modern uh, building. So her apartment was just right on the very top uh, of this building in this photograph. And uh, she did indeed have lifetime use uh, of that space. And um, the Leighton School of Art, you know, was described uh, by one writer as an illuminated ice cube on the bluff. And looking at this photograph, you really can see how, how that would definitely seem, especially what was seen from below from Lincoln Memorial Drive. <coughs> Sorry. So the Leighton uh, School of Art, uh, unfortunately, was very short-lived on that site because the park... Uh, uh, East Freeway or the, and the Lake Freeway uh, were being uh, considered to be built. And so when you think of the Park East Freeway, that kind of dead end ended at Ogden. Um, that was supposed to connect all the way down Ogden Street. That's why there's all of that new um, housing stock that was built in the last 30 years because it was replacing everything that had been torn down in the early 1970s. And so this would have connected um, with the home bridge. So you could see how that whole system would have worked where Park East Freeway would have connected with this interchange and then going south would have hit uh, the home bridge. And uh, an architectural firm had floated the idea of rebuilding the Leighton School of Art above the interchange. And that's what this photograph is showing. And, um, Unfortunately, the late School of Art was only 18 years old uh, when it was demolished. And you can see it's in the process of being uh, demolished in this photograph. Uh, it's the uh, building that's just kind of a little left, excuse me, a little right of uh, the center of this photograph. And so uh, that happened 50 years ago this year. And to this very day, that is still a vacant lot. Uh, it has never uh, been built on since then. And in 2016, uh, the Mandel Group had proposed building the portfolio. And this is still being, uh, is a concept that is out there. So I think eventually in the next, um, you know, five years, we will finally see something being built on that site. But to me, that's so interesting that uh, that, that, site, which is beautiful lake view, has sat vacant uh, for half a century. This is one of my favorite homes. It's, it was really well documented kind of from the from the beginning to the end. And you're and you're going to see the, the whole life of uh, the Charles Ray residence. Charles Ray was a very long lived uh, Milwaukee entrepreneur, banker, um, was just kind of uh, involved in so many different uh, parts of Milwaukee's commerce. And in 1877, he hired the architect uh, Edward Townsend Mix uh, to design this house. And I was trying to think of what architectural style, I mean, it really is, it's kind of, if you saw my talk on Grand Avenue 
it reminds me of the William Plankinson res residence kind of built in the American Renaissance uh, style that was made popular by the 1876 uh, um, Philadelphia uh, Exposition, the Centennial Exposition. So it's kind of like American Renaissance meets uh, Gothic Revival uh, as well, all done in gray quarried stone. And the previous one was a construction shot, and here we have it just absolutely brand spanking uh, new. And uh, Mr. Ray, as I had said, was a very long lived uh, gentleman. And he lived uh, um, until 1926, but in 1923, uh, he gave the house to the Wisconsin State Nurses, Nurses Association. And unfortunately, they were unable to maintain the house. And so they moved their quarters into uh, the stable and essentially closed up uh, the old mansion uh, itself. And so um, as the 20th century uh, wore on, they eventually sold it uh, to um, the Jewish Center of Milwaukee. And this would eventually become um, part of the JCC headquarters that were right down on Prospect Avenue. So this is kind of a, a photograph uh, from the late 1940s showing the house. And thanks to Lyle Oberweiss, who many of you may know is the Milwaukee uh, semi, uh, or it was more than an amateur photographer. He really documented Milwaukee at the mid-century. Uh, County Historical Society published a book on, on his photographs and he really captured in color, which I love, uh, a lot of these homes and kind of their last in their last days, and so he captured a number of images of the Charles Ray House uh, being torn down uh, in uh, 1950. And uh, here's the, the last shot of the of the Charles Ray home, and then um, shortly after the. Um, Charles Ray House was torn down. The Jewish Community Center was built just to the north of it. And so the Charles Ray House was actually the parking lot for the JCC. And then furthermore, the actual side of the Charles Ray House was eventually uh, developed uh, with this building built in 1974. And now today houses the Jewish Museum uh, of Milwaukee. So, so that particular uh, site is where the Charles Bray House was. So turning our glance just over to the inland side for a few minutes, I just want to talk to you uh, about uh, the Collins Elwell House and uh, the Washington Becker residence. And these are these two homes with these great towers. So uh, to me, this looks like something that would have been built outside of San Francisco in the 1870s. It was designed by James Douglas. Uh, one of the leading architects of the 1860s, 1870s uh, in Milwaukee. And this type of architecture is always referred to as kind of Ant Hill uh, architecture, where you just have all of these different points. I forget how many angles that the uh, roof line takes uh, in order to, to compose uh, the roof uh, of the Collins Elwell House. So the house was commissioned by Gilbert Collins, uh, although he never lived in it. Uh, the house eventually, when it was completed, was taken over uh, by Collins's daughter, uh, who had married Edward uh, Elwell. And they had uh, about a decade into the house uh, before it was sold to Alfred Carey. And the Carey family actually uh, stayed in the house until 1952. Now this house uh, still is with us and you might not recognize it in this photograph, but you might recognize it in this photograph. So uh, eventually um, the late 1930s, uh, all of the, the tower was taken off and a lot of the ornaments uh, was taken off of the building, but uh, you can definitely see um, the, the, the bones of this house uh, in this house today. So, and this house is being uh, beautifully uh, maintained as well. So next door to the uh, uh, Collins Elwell house uh, was the Washington uh, Becker house, originally built for O.J. Hale, 
but most closely known for its long association uh, with the Becker family. Uh, Washington Becker uh, was had financial interests in the Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul um, uh, Railroad. He was also president of the Marine National Bank after it was reorganized uh, after the um, Depression of 1893. Uh, and uh, he stayed in this house until 1929. And then his son, uh, Sherborne or Sherby uh, Becker, who is Milwaukee's boy mayor, um, lived in this house as well. And just so you're getting what this photograph is, you're looking through the carriage entrance to the port cochere of the Charles Ray house across the streets uh, to uh, the, um, the Becker house, which I think is a great way to, to look at. Uh, eventually, uh, the house uh, was purchased by the Fenwick uh, Club, and they purchased the house in 1937. It was a Catholic male students club. Eventually, it was uh, torn down in the 1960s and 1963 uh, to make way for the Fenwick Apartments. So, again, a, a major change from a very Victorian building to a very modern building designed by uh, George Miller and George Walt. The Willard Merrill residence is one of those rare and unique survivors on Prospect Avenue that is almost completely uh, unchanged. It even still has its original carriage house uh, as well. And Willard Merrill hired uh, James Douglas in 1890 uh, to design this home. Uh, he was, uh, Merrill was actually a vice president of Northwestern Mutual Life and again, the house, the uh, Merrill House, uh, which is on the left side of this photograph, is still very much uh, with us, including a couple of its um, uh, early 20th century uh, um, neighbors as well. Back over to the lake side was the home of Christian Wall. Uh, Christian Wall was um, had made his fortune in glue in Chicago. And I uh, was originally, he did come from Milwaukee earlier in his life, went to Chicago, made his fortune and then retired back in Milwaukee. And we should all be very grateful that he did because he was the founder of the Milwaukee park system and really pushed for the acquisition of the four main uh, original parks in Milwaukee. And so an invitation to the wall house was highly coveted. They, did a lot of uh, entertaining with um, uh, theater and uh, operatic um, uh, entertainers that came to Milwaukee. And so invitation to this house was highly coveted. Uh, the walls had stayed uh, in the house until the early 1930s when the contents of the home were sold. It became a rooming house. And then during its kind of latter years, it was the home of uh, 20 displaced uh, Japanese American families. And essentially, after World War II, it was uh, abandoned. Uh, there was a fire in uh, the coach house. And then finally, uh, in the late 1940s, the entire uh, house was pulled down. And so keep this house and the next couple in mind, actually the next three, uh, because essentially they were all pulled down and are part of one complex today. So we'll see if you can guess what complex uh, that all makes up uh, today. So this was the Ferdinand Slazinger house. And this um, this really was considered one of the great homes of Prospect Avenue and of Milwaukee at the time. Um, it would have been one of the most expensive homes built in the city, uh, cost $150,000 in 1890s uh, dollars, which literally would be tens of millions of dollars today to, to build a house uh, such as this. Uh, Crane and Barkhausen were the architects, and uh, Ferdinand Slazinger made and lost many fortunes during his life, and unfortunately, a few years into living into this house, which had the first residential uh, elevator um, as one of its many appointments, uh, lost his fortune. And so in 1895, this house was sold at a sheriff's sale on the steps of the courthouse and uh, the sheriff famously saying, what will you give me for this palace? And so the $150,000 house in 1890 
became the eighty thousand dollar house in eighteen ninety five and was sold to August Galoon, who owned uh, uh, Galoon Tanning uh, Company, and so uh, eventually. The Galoon sold uh, the house and it was purchased in 1926 uh, to the Colting Society. It became a boys' home and uh, it then became a radio station and then uh, was also one of the first homes uh, to the Jewish Community Center. So uh, this uh, house uh, eventually was pulled down in 1950 to make way for the uh, Jewish Community Center that we saw earlier. So I kind of gave that away, but there's a little, a couple more pieces to this puzzle. So the John and William Van Dyke residences were a pair of um, large homes. They were brothers. They were also a brother of uh, George Douglas Van Dyke, who had that double house earlier in the presentation. All three brothers uh, lived on Prospect Avenue. And uh, this is a great shot of the portico of the uh, William um, Van Dyke residence looking towards the tower of the uh, Elwell uh, house. And um, the John Van Dyke uh, residence um, eventually became the Fleetwood uh, rooming house in November 26. And then Patients from Shore View Retirement Home uh, moved there in 1962. And uh, then eventually, both of these homes uh, were pulled down. And all of these last four homes we've talked about now today make up High Point uh, Retirement Community. So now you can think of all of those homes on that stretch uh, during those years uh, prior to the mid-century. So back on the inland side, we have the William, um, excuse me, William Osborne residence. And this was designed by Alfred Kloss, who was one of the architects of the Pabst Mansion. And this is, I always like these construction photographs where just when it's uh, being completed. And uh, this uh, eventually uh, became uh, um, the home to the Milwaukee Institute of Music. And this was actually one of the first homes on Prospect Avenue uh, to have a business in it. And that was became very controversial because a lot of people saw what had happened on Grand Avenue with apartment buildings replacing older homes. And they really were hoping that uh, the building codes wouldn't allow for high-rise apartment buildings on uh, the avenue, and you know, there were all these home businesses that were starting to take off, and so they could see that the neighborhood was becoming much more commercialized. Uh, and so, even though that these homes that had these businesses were frowned upon, a lot of them um, ended up having business in because a lot of these homes were just were so impractical. Uh, to keep up even as early as World War I. It's pretty remarkable. Uh, one story that I just wanted to share with you is I bumped into this completely by accident that um, in Juno Park, you know, where um, kind of Juno dead ends and State Street dead ends, that's Juno Park, um, there were some homes in the northern end uh, of that area and they wanted to extend the park. And then finally, in, the 19, in 1925, there was a proposal that was floated to uh, the city should spend about $5 million and to purchase up all of the old mansions on the east side of Prospect Avenue and pull them all down, all the way to Kane Place, So, which is kind of where we're, we're going tonight, uh, to Kane Place is kind of our end point tonight. So imagine all of the structures between uh, Juno Park and Cane Place being torn down. And then there was another plan to essentially tear down everything on Lafayette and Terrace that faced the south and east sides of those streets. So essentially, if this whole plan had worked, you would have had a green belt all the way from Juno Park to Lake Park, which is kind of extraordinary to think about. And uh, the Great Depression, of course, really kind of quashed that idea. But it, to me, it's fascinating from an urban history point uh, of, 
of interests, uh, this idea of pulling down all of those structures to extend uh, a large, long green belts uh, along the lake. So back to our story about the Osborne House. So it had been a rooming house. It became law offices. And now is the uh, offices of Malik and Goisman. And they've done an amazing job uh, restoring uh, the house back to its original uh, uh, appearance, cleaning all the paints uh, off the brick, and uh, still very much one of Alfred Kloss's best works of that 1880s period. Uh, the Fred Krauss house is, to me, one of the uh, unsung heroes in Milwaukee uh, uh, architecture. And I just, I love pointing this house out. It was designed by Eugene Liebert, who really was kind of one of Milwaukee's foremost uh, and kind of forward-thinking architects just after the turn of the century. This house was built in 1904. And George Van Niedeken, who was... Um, kind of a like-minded interior architect would have done uh, interior design work on this building as well. And uh, Liebert was fascinated with the Jugendstil uh, movement, which was kind of the like the Vienna Secession in Austria or the Art Nouveau uh, movement in France. And uh, this is one of the only homes in Milwaukee that uh, he built in this style. It, was built within a year of the Henry Harnischweger House on Grand Avenue, which is still standing at near 35th and Grand. So those, these two homes are kind of uh, of that same um, um, aesthetic. And the Krauss House is still standing. It was eventually purchased uh, in the summer of 1950 uh, by Alcoholics Anonymous, and it is still home to the Alano Club uh, to this day. But uh, it's such a great building. Next time you're on Prospect, definitely uh, admire it. It really is. A, it's an important building in, in Milwaukee's architectural history. Back on the lakeside was the William Bigelow residence uh, designed by Alexander Eschweiler in 1901. Uh, Bigelow uh, was uh, a banker with the First National Bank and uh, was um, built of raindrop brick uh, that gave the effect of being weather beaten and worn by age when it was brand new. Uh, and a great quote uh, kind of in the latter years uh, of the house, Bigelow sold it uh, in 1917 and uh, by 1921 it had become uh, the Surf uh, Hotel, uh, which was kind of a legendary, I still, know people that would go to the surf uh, for an, an elegant uh, meal. And so even in its, its waning days, a uh, few old homes in Milwaukee have as charming, uh, are as charming now as they were when they were new. Uh, and it was raised for a nursing home, uh, which uh, gave way uh, to more construction 2001, 2002 of uh, 1522 um, uh, condominium building. A part of that parcel uh, of land just to the north was the George W. Peck residence. And the Peck house was actually built uh, by William Metcalf, one of the great boot and shoe manufacturers in Milwaukee, Bradley Metcalf. He had built it for his daughter and his daughter and her husband, Melbert, uh, moved uh, to New York shortly after it was completed. And uh, George Peck, who was the governor and he was uh, also a writer at the time, <coughs> excuse me, uh, had purchased the house. And famously, this house, uh, probably designed by Charles Gombert, who designed the water tower uh, um, structure down by the lake, and you can kind of, he liked working in this rough hewn lime, limestone. Interestingly, the, the street side uh, of this particular house was always considered to be the back side and was very austere and fortress like, and the lake side was supposed to be this very beautiful side. Unfortunately, I've never found a photograph of it. So it, it, we only have this particular uh, side. 
And it's interesting that because this was considered the back side of the house and the front yard was considered the backyard by Mr. Peck, he actually had his milk cow tethered to the uh, front yard or the backyard uh, of this house, which really drove his neighbors crazy. So this house uh, eventually became a rooming house. A lot of these homes were uh, um, used by the students of the Layton School of Arts uh, when they were uh, on Prospect Avenue. And uh, eventually this too uh, was torn down in the 1960s. And so the Bigelow House and the Peck House uh, make up the footprint of the 1522 building today. The Frederick Gall residence, uh, another uh, rare survivor on Prospect Avenue, designed by Farian Kloss in 1898 and have this um, uh, Jacobethan, a mix of uh, Jacobean and Elizabethan architectural style that became popular in the 20th century. Uh, the Gull House, um, it, you know, is beautifully maintained well into the 20th century by the Gall family. And one of the Gall daughters I remembered on Wednesday evenings, uh, beginning at 9 p.m., Cruz uh, would hose down uh, all the streets, uh, the Cedar Block streets uh, uh, of Prospect Avenue. So it's a very well, well um, maintained uh, part of Prospect Avenue. And so this house has survived and there are all these plans about um, maintaining the house and then building uh, the uh, uh, residential tower behind it. And so this will still be, we're waiting to see what will happen with this. And uh, it's definitely a, an amazing uh, house as well. Definitely uh, worthy of, of its preservation. Uh, the Elizabeth Black House, which I'll be on, it, the front door actually faces Albion, but it does have a Prospect Avenue uh, address, w was one of a couple of homes that Eschweiler designed, uh, along with the Charles Alice uh, Museum that we'll be seeing a little bit later. That's these kind of long homes that faced the side streets, but were still considered part of uh, Prospect Avenue. Uh, this was uh, an amazing house. And again, mixing Tudor, Elizabethan, and Jacobean uh, styles uh, together. And um, uh, Gustav Paps Jr. had also remembered uh, Libby Black. She was uh, Elizabeth Black was the daughter of John Black, one of Milwaukee's earlier mayors. Uh, she never married, so this was a uh, home for um, um, a single woman. And Gustav Papst Jr. remembered uh, Elizabeth or Libby Black. Uh, she was known for her great hospitality, uh, her booming voice, and her silk stockings, uh, which she wore in green, blue, and flaming red, which even in old age, she never gave up. So uh, uh, Miss Elizabeth Black stayed in this house until... Um, the 1920s when she decided to move to Terrace Avenue and Thomas Van Elia Sr. purchased uh, this house and eventually converted it uh, into uh, a number of different apartments as well. And uh, Tom Van Elia Sr. Had, was quoted in 1963 as saying, the remodeling of this house has been terribly costly and there isn't a great reward in it but I feel that these charming places still can play a role in our society. And so uh, the Elizabeth Black House is still there and still looks uh, as magnificent as it did in uh, 1901 when it was built. This was <clears throat> a photograph taken near Curtis and Prospect or Albion and uh, Prospect. Uh, just one of the, um, household coachman having his photograph uh, taken with a carriage. And um, this is this is how uh, Prospect Avenue uh, is, is uh, at the mid-century or was at the mid-century and still is to this day. I take uh, North Prospect uh, almost every day and uh, it seems like we're always merging uh, to the left. 
uh, to get down, especially with uh, the St. John's Tower having been uh, built in the last year and a half. So this scene is still not so much this, but very much this. So one of the main differences between Grand Avenue and Prospect Avenue is that it was a much denser uh, number of homes. I'm sure you're getting a sense of that from this uh, from this talk tonight. That just it was just chock a block uh, homes. They were not large lots, so they were just really building almost to the lot lines, and you really get a sense of that here. So I just want to point out the house on the on the left side of this photograph that eventually was transformed in the 1960s to this. So uh, again, this was uh, to be built as a motel, but the neighbors complained complained that they didn't want a neon motel sign on the side of it. So uh, kind of mid construction, it was uh, transformed into efficiency uh, apartments. Just north of that was the Jonas Cohen residence uh, designed by Alfred Kloss as well in kind of a Richardsonian uh, Romanesque style. And uh, this um, residence uh, eventually became um, a rooming house um, for um, Catholic students, I think Marquette students, uh, which seems so far away from Marquette's campus, but they used uh, this house as a dormitory. Eventually, that line of photograph, a line of homes that we saw were essentially all pulled down uh, to make way for the Goldemeyer um, apartments that are now on um, Prospect Avenue. Another one of the, the great homes of Prospect, uh, and always referred to as the, the old castle on Prospect, literally. I mean, it's pretty remarkable. This one was definitely designed by Charles Gombert, uh, again, the architect of um, the water tower, built in 1890 uh, for David Benjamin. And unfortunately he died uh, just shortly after it was completed and never was able to really enjoy the house. But his uh, widow remained in the house uh, for the rest of her life until I believe 1938. And then their son, uh, again, remained in the house until his death in 1945. So it stayed in the Benjamin family until uh, 1945. In 1946, it became uh, the Shoreview home. And it became a retirement home. And uh, that lasted uh, for about 15 years. And here's a great um, color photograph from a slide that shows um, the lakeside of the uh, Benjamin house. And you can just see all the all these great uh, roof lines. The structure on the right side of this photograph is just actually the stable for the house, which is pretty remarkable. And, um, you know, apartments were creeping up on the Benjamin castle. I love how just pristine that house uh, still looked uh, in the 1950s. And so uh, the Bonaire apartments were built right to its lot line. And then eventually uh, the Benjamin house was torn down in 1963 in order to build. Uh, here we have a couple of Lyle Oberweiss slides of the demolition of the house. And then eventually <clears throat> the Quarles house apartment building was built on that site, which it's so vertical. You really got a sense of how horizontal the Benjamin house was, but uh, just how, how much density you could actually get on a piece of property, you know, that maybe would have served 10 or 20 uh, roomers uh, in, in a rooming house, but then you can actually move into hundreds uh, in um, one of these buildings. So this is the Charles McIntosh uh, residence, uh, again, still with us. Uh, built in 1904, designed by Chicago architect Horatio Wil Wilson. Uh, McIntosh died in 1910. His widow sold the house in 1921. Uh, sold it to William O. Goodrich and his wife Marie. Uh, Marie was uh, the middle child of Captain Frederick and uh, Maria Pabst. And William O. Goodrich uh, had um, 
apparently an amazing tenor voice and loved uh, music. And so when they decided to move uh, to Fox Point uh, in the 1930s, uh, they leased it to the Wisconsin uh, College uh, of Music in 1932, which is now uh, the um, Wisconsin Conservatory of Music. And so that has, I mean, it's, we're slowly working our way up to a hundred years that uh, the Conservatory of Music has been in that building, which is uh, remarkable. So you're seeing the Macintosh or the Goodrich House just to the right side of this photograph and the portico mansion to the uh, left side or the center of this photograph was the home of O.Z. Uh, or Oscar uh, Z. Bartlett. And um, it's, it's so funny with some of these homes, we know so little about them. There might be a, a snapshot, which this is, um, um, you know, this is like one of the only photographs we have of this house. And we just know that it became horribly derelict uh, in the 1930s, so much so that the owner of the house that you can barely see on the far left of this photograph uh, bought the house in order that she could tear it down because it was such an eyesore. So still looking for more information on that house. And this was the, the home that um, of uh, Adolf Kern, who was in the, in the milling business, eventually purchased by um, uh, Emil Shandine and his wife, uh, Estella. And when they were living in the, this house, this is when they purchased the Bartlett house in order to uh, pull it down. But um, this eventually was sold in the 1940s uh, to the American Red Cross. So this is, I think, a kind of interesting statistic. In 1941, this was this house was sold for $18,000 to the American Red Cross. Then in 1955, so you know, a decade and a half later, the price had risen to uh, $95,000. So again, the the by the mid-century and after World War II, these properties were becoming uh, valuable because they were being torn down. And in this case, uh, the Newport designed by Russell Barr Williamson was built uh, on that site in 1958, um, uh, uh, which is kind of an iconic uh, mid-century building in its own right now. Across the street, you had the Thomas Keenan residence uh, built uh, in 1885 by James Douglas for uh, the lawyer of the Wisconsin Central uh, Railroad. And um, what I like about this next series of photographs, you really see how these homes matured very quickly. So you have brand new 1880s, kind of turn of the century, 1910. And then by the 1930s, just overgrown and just, you know, kind of at the end of its life. A lot of these homes were 35, 45 years old when they were being torn down. And so this too was replaced by um, the 1609 apartments uh, designed by Russell Barr Williamson as well. So he was a protege of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. And uh, at the time that this was completed in 1940, um, their promotional material said that 1609 North Prospect Avenue rears its distinguished mass of steel and stone to face eastward towards the most beautiful harbor in America. So again, kind of sweeping away that early uh, period of history uh, to make way for the bright young progress that Milwaukee was making. The Oliver Pillsbury residence was on the lakeside and um, Again, Mr. Pillsbury didn't make it too long into the life of his home, but his wife uh, stayed uh, in the house. Her name was Vesta, a name that I think should definitely make a comeback uh, today. Uh, so Vesta inherited a fortune of $770,000, which was a tremendous amount of money uh, at that time. And unfortunately, she was uh, swindled by a uh, Chicago 
uh, lawyer who uh, said that he would make investments of the money and then essentially absconded with her her fortune. And so towards the end of her life, she was really having trouble making ends meet uh, and supporting uh, the upkeep of uh, this house. And so she died in uh, 1919. And uh, there was a tremendous auction that took place. Uh, everything in the house was sold. And so literally hundreds of people came to the auction and they marched through the entire house from attic, third floor, second floor, main floor and basement, uh, selling everything. I think it was like a two or three day sale. It was uh, tremendous. Eventually uh, this became uh, the home of the Lake School for Girls. And then later on, it became the uh, Pillsbury Manor, uh, which was a, a rooming house and 39 apartments uh, were carved up in, in that house. And eventually it was torn down uh, to build the Prospect Towers in 1965. George, uh, George, George, Judge George Noyes, and sorry, this says notes, but it's actually Noyes, it, it autocorrect, it's N-O-Y-E-S. Uh, this was one of George Bowman Ferry, another one of the Pepps Mansion's architects, uh, designed this house uh, in 1886. It was considered kind of one of the first uh, English Queen Anne style homes in Milwaukee, and really was uh, exceptional in its detailing and ornaments and leaded glass windows. Uh, and Judge Noyes was the legal counsel for the Northwestern Mutual Life uh, Company. And uh, George Bowman Ferry really kind of spent uh, a lot of time kind of detailing this house and it had the most extraordinary uh, relief panel, which you can kind of see on the second floor. Um, of all of these uh, uh, cherubs uh, frolicking uh, in this plaster bas relief. And uh, in 1939, an architect said, we can imagine the fun Mr. Ferry must have had working with the modeler to get the exact results he desired uh, for the unique and original uh, treatment over the porch and the parade of cherubims under the cornice. So uh, eventually, uh, this house, which uh, was sold and became uh, a rooming house, was torn down in 1950 to make way for the Prospect uh, Heights apartments. The George Heinemann house was kind of the, one of the last battles, or one of the last more recent battles uh, uh, of preservation of one of these uh, Prospect Avenue homes in the 1980s. So by the 1980s, people were realizing that some of these places, you know, the few that remain should be saved. And I remember this as a teenager, the, the battle for uh, the preservation of this house. And uh, some thought that uh, this home, which uh, was built in um, around 1888, uh, designed by Henry uh, Koch, who was the architect of City Hall, uh, was definitely worth uh, saving and should be um, perhaps the residents of the Milwaukee mayor. They were looking at several Prospect Avenue homes that could be converted uh, to a mayoral residence. Uh, however, del developers really wanted to get this uh, down because they wanted to develop that site. And uh, I remember talking to uh, one of the wreckers at the time on this house because it, it did come down very quickly. And um, there was a huge boarded up section of this house. And uh, it was when the wrecking ball went through, it was 16 feet of stained glass came through this kind of chute uh, that had been created by it being boarded up on both sides. It was the original landing window uh, that had been boarded up many years ago. Uh, so. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of architectural elements went down uh, with this house. Again, Lyle Overweis uh, captured uh, kind of the, the last moments of uh, the Heinemann residence. And in its place uh, went uh, the um, landmark on the lake. 
uh, which uh, was completed in uh, 1989, 1990. George Peck, uh, our gentleman who kept his Jersey cow in the front yard, also had uh, a couple of other properties in uh, on Prospect and also on Farwell. This one I like just for the, again, the transformation from brand new kind of middle age and then kind of at the very end. So uh, this double house along with several others were torn down to make way for uh, the diamond tower in uh, 1981. Oh, sorry. And here we have the Diamond Tower. Uh, Louis Shackman uh, was uh, built this house uh, in 1895. Uh, and the Shackmans uh, stayed in the house until the 1920s when it was eventually sold uh, to a group called the Marwood Studios. And they were uh, taught music uh, and dance. And Marwood Studios eventually left this uh, uh, home and it was transformed into this apartment building. So I always think that's kind of a interesting transformation of that site from that to that. The Adler House uh, remains uh, almost exactly the way it was built, designed by Alfred Kloss uh, in 1888. It had a twin that lived on Grand Avenue, which was torn down in the 1960s, but almost identical uh, in every detail. Uh, this is a Lyle Overweiss uh, photograph taken in the 1970s, but again, it really has not uh, changed at all. This is also uh, maintained by Dan Wilhelms, and there's scaffolding all over this house. They're doing all sorts of uh, tuck pointing and, and restoration. Uh, to the house uh, currently, but uh, it was a rooming house for many years and has been brought back and, and used for offices today. Another castle, this is always confused with uh, the Benjamin Castle. They look very much alike. This one was designed by Otto Strock, uh, who was the architect of the Pabst Theater. And this was done right before Otto Strock moved to New York, where he went on to have a career designing skyscrapers, but he had designed uh, several prominent Milwaukee uh, mansions. And this was uh, owned by uh, one of the heirs to the, the Blatt's Brewing Company fortune. This house unfortunately fell on hard times uh, shortly uh, within less than 30 years of its construction, essentially was abandoned. And uh, you can see where certain things are kind of boarded up in this photograph. And here are things, you know, just completely, uh, um, falling apart and with a lot of these homes you know in the 1930s uh, uh, basically in the 30s through um the depression there just weren't people to buy these homes and so a lot of them the families would move out and literally just leave the front doors open and uh eventually the city uh acquired this house in 1938 they had thought of using it for a children's museum. And uh, by 1940, um, it was a completely, uh, there was just no way to save it. And so 1941, it was sold. And uh, the next time you were at the stoplight on North Prospect at uh, Brady Street, and you look to your right towards the lake uh, where that walkway uh, goes, uh, the path goes down to the footbridge uh, over Lincoln Memorial Drive. That's right where uh, this house originally sat, which is still uh, essentially a vacant lot. I just put this in because I think it's it's kind of a quirky, uh, picturesque house. Uh, Hamilton Vose uh, was a partner in a Southside foundry, uh, and he built this house in 1884. And uh, we have a couple of photographs of it, and it was designed by Alexander Oki, who was a New York City architect. So it's it's interesting. It's a really picturesque, quirky house designed by a New York City architect. We hardly know anything about, but the reason why I wanted to show it to you is that this is one of the few examples that we actually have uh, the lakeside view of what the house uh, looked like. Eventually, 
this home was torn down in 1950 to make way for the Lake Crest uh, apartments. So Louis Pettit was known as Milwaukee's Salt King, and he was a banker and a financier and uh, held some sort of like one fifth of control of America's uh, salt trade. And he had Farring Kloss design essentially what I call a bank building for his, uh, for his personal residence. Uh, I also uh, think that Mr. Pettit had uh, his own photographer that was there because so, there's so many photographs of his house and his horses and his carriages as vehicles. Uh, so we'll take a little tour here. So this is uh, the house uh, as it appeared uh, around uh, 1910. And uh, he actually published a, a little album of photographs uh, he called his house the Anchorage, and so he would hand out these books on the Anchorage to his friends, and essentially they were just photograph albums of uh, his entire complex, in which you are seeing right now. This is the stable block overlooking the lake. Uh, when carriages and horses were in fashion, he had those photographed. When cars came in, he had those photographed. <laughs> Uh, this is the inside of the stable. It really is exceptional because uh, most people obviously didn't go to these links to have their uh, residences photographed. So from a historical standpoint, it's really interesting to, to see this. Uh, the tack room of the stable. The horses in the stable. And then moving into the inside of the house, which was just crammed full of uh, amazing objects. This great Tiffany lamp that's sitting on the corner of uh, the piano is remarkable. Uh, and here's the the grand staircase uh, rising up to the uh, third floor, the second floor, and then it has third floor, uh, one of the first private ballrooms uh, in uh, Milwaukee as well. So uh, Louis Pettit uh, dies in, I believe it was around 1919. And then his daughter tried keeping the house going, and it was just, it was so expensive to maintain it that eventually in 1933, it was leased uh, to the Cudworth uh, Legion uh, uh, post. And so it became a clubhouse. And in uh, 1938, uh, she finally sold uh, the house and much of its contents uh, to uh, the Legion post. And unfortunately, in July of 1938, literally the ink was barely dry on the paper. Somebody had dropped a cigarette uh, and had smoldered in a couch and literally the entire interior of the house, along with many of the art treasures, uh, went up in flames that summer night uh, in July of 1938. And essentially the house was a loss. And so you can see the Pettit house in uh, the proce process of being demolished uh, and the new Cudworth ho post uh, in the background uh, when it was built and completed uh, in 1940. Uh, famously, um, uh, General MacArthur, when he came to Milwaukee in 1951, drove through this uh, horseshoe uh, driveway to to greet people, and uh, it uh, he didn't slow down, or his driver didn't slow down at all. So that gave rise to the uh, the quote in Milwaukee that old soldiers don't die; they just drive away. So, so where the Pettit House uh, today is actually where St. John's uh, Southern Tower. Uh, is um, um, presently and was built upon that site. And uh, there were actually several homes that were on the St. John's property, including uh, the uh, George Swallow uh, residence, also known as the George Houghton residence. And this was a really early house. This kind of goes back to those early homes uh, that we saw in that first shot. So this would have been an 1860s, 1870s Italianate that uh, had a really beautiful 
description of this property and its, its earlier days of an apple orchard uh, surrounding it. And so it had actually made it through all the way to the 1960s when it was sold to Cudworth Post in 1963 and uh, torn down as a parking lot uh, for Cudworth Post and then eventually became the site of the kind of the first wing uh, of uh, St. John's. So just pushing through uh, to the end here, we have uh, the John Frank uh, residence, which actually might have been earlier structure that was encased around 1905 by Max Fernicke, uh, architect for John Frank, who was one of the partners in Gull and Frank. And this building is still standing today. It was uh, became a nursing home uh, in the mid 20th century. Uh, and now is the home of Miller Communication. And then of course the Charles Alice uh, residence. Uh, Charles Alice and his wife, Sarah, uh, were married in 1877. And he, he was the third child of uh, Edward E.P. E. Alice, um, of the, uh, but eventually became Alice Chalmers and Charles Alice became uh, the president of Alice Chalmers uh, eventually. Uh, but Charles and his wife, uh, Sarah, uh, they, it was really interesting. They lived for much of their marriage uh, at the Hotel Pfister, at the Pfister Hotel, which I think is really interesting. Uh, he had picked up art collecting from his father who had one of the great 19th century Milwaukee art collections, uh, some of his Great paintings are at the Milwaukee Art Museum today, including uh, uh, Boston Lepage's uh, The Wood Gatherer and um, uh, The Two Majesties, with, you know, the, the Sun and the Lion uh, together. So two very iconic paintings collected by the uh, Alice family. So uh, in 1909, they hired Alexander Eschweiler to build uh, this home uh, and it really is one of those homes that was purpose built to eventually become uh, a museum. Uh, Charles Alice dies in 1918. His wife remains there until her death in 1945 and then it opened up uh, as a museum in 1946, a year afterwards. And it still displays their really fine uh, art collection. And here it is today. The George Tibbetts house, we really don't know too much about because Mrs. Alice purchased it eventually in the 20th century and had it torn down. It was actually right there, uh, what makes up the courtyard uh, of her uh, residence uh, is where the George Tibbetts uh, residence once stood. So as we're coming up to Kane, we have uh, a couple of homes built by the Kane family. Uh, this one was built uh, essentially as an investment property uh, and uh, was eventually torn down in uh, the 1960s uh, to build uh, this uh, nursing home, which has since been uh, transformed into a very stylish uh, residence uh, today. But uh, the Sanford King uh, residence still stands today as really such a great, unique uh, home that uh, typifies the Queen Anne uh, style. And uh, this house uh, eventually became a rooming house and later a nursing home and then a monastery school and then a church and has just recently sold again, but still again, it's been beautifully maintained. H.H. Benjamin, uh, we're, we're at the end, folks. This is the last house. So H.H. H. Benjamin uh, was a coal merchant uh, in Milwaukee. He hired uh, Alfred Kloss to design uh, this, this beautiful home for him, uh, kind of in the Richardsonian Romanesque style. And this is one of the, I, I love that this is one of the very few interior photographs we have of a um, uh, Prospect Avenue mansion. So at least you get some idea of what one of these homes look like uh, on the interior. Uh, the Benjamins did something a lot of families on Grand Avenue and Prospect Avenue did. They had these large lots, but then eventually um, as apartment buildings were becoming more and more popular, uh, 
uh, they were having uh, the, their lots kind of subdivided out and apartments or flat buildings built. The Benjamin Flats was a very kind of uh, fine uh, uh, residence. Uh, it made up was made up of twelve apartments of eight or nine rooms each, uh, and it said the appointments will make it a mansion uh, because they had all the you know, latest conveniences, uh, servants' quarters, and electric lighting, electric uh, this, and electric that. Uh, these were really large uh, apartments. And uh, eventually, uh, the Benjamin house, uh, which had also become a rooming house, uh, was torn down and left the Benjamin Flats all by itself. And then a fire in the Benjamin Flats in the mid-1980s uh, came kind of hastened its demise and became a parking lot for St. John's uh, um, home, which... At 8.45 this morning, you would have seen me kneeling on Prospect Avenue, taking this photograph of the North Tower at St. John's, which was built on the site of the Benjamin Flats. So that is the end. Well, round, round <laughs> take a drink of water, please. Is, is anybody still Oh, yeah. Still awake? We are... Uh... We are we we, uh, we still have over <laughs> almost five hundred people here right now, um, so thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for staying for that for that whole long show. So so right now this turns into uh, the Q and A portion of things for a few minutes. So if you have any questions that uh, were burning in your mind, uh, please please uh, this now is time to pick the brain of a of a great architectural historian. Um, I'll get you kind of started off. I here. know these. Presentations are supposed to last a half an hour, but an hour, oh, an hour and a half? What? It was raining. We're good. Uh, yeah, I know. Dark and stormy night. Yeah, right. Dark and stormy night. Uh, what else so. are we going to do? But no, that was fantastic to see all that. And of course, like a lot of it comes down to when we see those pictures of the demolishing of these historic structures. And we're like, ah. Yeah. And then you see what replaces them. And you're kind of like, ah. Um, so I, I guess I have two parts to a question to get things kicked off again yeah. if, if you have if anybody has a question ask it otherwise i'll just talk with john um but the first is um you know the reason that they were demolished um so you kind of alluded to like a lot of them turned into rooming houses over the years yeah. and for a long time you were associated with like the pabst mansion Right. I th I was maybe wondering if like, and maybe not to like the exact dollar amount, but if you could kind of expound on how expensive it is to maintain one of these historic homes. Oh, it's crazy. I mean, it really, it, it is crazy. And uh, I, I remember saying, I've said so many times during my career at the Pepsi Mansion was like, how could a private individual, even with, pots and pots and pots of money keep a place like this up because it just, you know, it just, it's, it's next to impossible. I mean, you really would have to be raising millions of dollars every single year to, you know, just to keep it going, you know, and, and the Pabst is kind of, you know, one of the largest homes that was ever built in Milwaukee. So that's, you know, that's one thing. And a lot of these homes were maybe, half the size, but even, even still, you know, just between roof and tuck pointing issues. Well, you, you saw how so many of these places looked when they were like 35 years old, they were just, they were tired. I mean, they yeah. were like, it was the end, you know? And I, I, um, I was just reading something that I thought was really interesting is that, uh, that some of these people that, that people in general during the Gilded Age and the 1890s were driven to build these places and then they didn't know what to do afterwards, you know, and their families didn't know what to do afterwards. I mean, so few of these places actually had even a second generation that spent time in the home. And even the the ones that had like two or three generations on Grand Avenue or Prospect Avenue, they were typically the smaller, older homes you know they weren't like the big mansions nobody nobody stayed in those longer than the uh, essentially the original owner so so it was just kind of in vogue for a certain period of time where it's like i have this much yeah. money i have to build a big house so here we go yeah 
Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It, it's, it's really, it's, it's almost, it's, it's, it's kind of a shame then if they would have built a more manageable space that might still exist today. Right. Yeah. I mean, what, what did that even, well, and just, you know, all the conveniences that came in the 20th century, you know, you didn't need staff, you know, and that that's, I always think that's kind of one of the reasons why a lot of these places didn't survive is that they were just built differently. Uh, case in point, uh, the Peps Mansion is 20,000 square feet. 8,500 square feet was for the Peps family. 12,000 square feet was for the staff. And so, so more space these places the were built completely upside down. Yeah. You know, and so when people no longer had people working for them in their homes, you had like over half your house that was just completely sitting vacant. And here my and head, then you're trying to now, figure out how to shut that feet. off so you're not heating it. Yeah. You know, and so and then you're not heating it and then the plaster starts falling off the wall. You know, it it really does it, it's just it's it's just kind of a known known formula. Sure. How these places just don't make it, you know. So so first question from the audience is from Holly, and she's saying, was there any architectural salvage done that could be reused? Or I'll even add on to that, like, can you see parts of these mansions in other places in Milwaukee, like today? Oh, that's, that's a really good question. Um, yes, there was. I think people by the 1960s really started seeing the kind of the artistic value of some of the things that were in these homes, like the stained glass windows and the light fixtures and the doorknobs and all those kinds of things. So people, there were salvage companies in Milwaukee, especially in the 70s and early 80s that dealt in architectural salvage. So there were people doing that. And to the question of, can we see it? Uh, the Milwaukee Redevelopment Authority had salvaged a lot of the material out of the Elizabeth Plankton mansion. And so, so some of the back bars at the Paps Theater uh, are actually the mantelpieces from the Elizabeth Plankton house. Well, that's pretty cool. So the next time you're there, definitely take notice of that. So yeah, I mean, there, there was a very active culture in Milwaukee in the 70s and 80s of people kind of salvaging uh, some of this stuff. Unfortunately, a lot of these homes came down 40s, 50s, 60s, when there was a completely different uh, attitude. Uh, uh, the newspapers at the time are are classic of, you know, bulldozing the past to build the future uh, kind of mentality. So uh, all this Victorian stuff that just was really out of date, out of favor, they were happy to see it go away. So, but there were always the people out there that, you know, wanted to save bits and pieces if they could. Sure. Um, I'm going to ask, we're, we're, we're uh, maybe for a couple of questions here, but I want to, this is a really, I think, an important one here because I know uh -huh. a, lot of, a lot of neighborhoods in certain locales are protected by uh, historic designations from the National yep. Service or whatever. So Julie is asking, are the remaining mansions on Prospect Act historically protected today? Uh, hey, Julia, good to see you. Um, they are to a certain extent. They are to a certain extent. I, you know, I will be honest, I never feel like anything is safe, ultimately, you know, that you always have to fight for it. Because if there's uh, investments that somebody's willing to make, you know, it, it makes it hard for things to stay there if it's going to increase the tax base or put something new there, you know, it becomes a really difficult argument. Uh, certain parts of the city are in, you know, historic districts, so you really, you know, it does become um, more difficult, but a place like Prospect Avenue, and this was something that even in the 1920s and 30s, again, they saw what was happening on Grand Avenue, and they really didn't want the zoning to change to mixed residential commercial, and because it did, it does have that, you know, that designation, so there there will always be people that will push to develop on a street like that. Sure. You know, parts of Lake Drive or, you know, other parts of the city, zone residential, you know, there might be a couple of exceptions that are grandfathered in, but, you know, it's just a uh, place like Prospect is, because it's close to downtown, is it's tough. It, 
you know, there will always be that push to possibly demolish something. So sure. All right, one more before we wrap up, and you can go enjoy your whiskey evening. Um, but uh, okay, so we saw a lot of um, a lot of like so a lot of mansions that were torn down and then replaced by something. Yeah. Uh, do you have a favorite replacement building on Prospect Ave? I do. Of like here's you know yeah. this instance where a building torn down. Where I do love if you want to pull the slide up, I can pull it back up onto the thing too. Okay. How did I do this again? Because I think oh, often, oh. like, it, like, and I, I am, you know, a lot of times people take, uh, take, you know, look at the photos, and be like, oh, I wish that came back. And I think sometimes it's not necessarily, you know, sometimes the world needs to grow. Um, it does. It needs to change. Does, Otherwise, we have sure. no diversity texture. But I, right. but you know, I, and and sometimes it's like, oh, I wish we could still have this around, and you know, uh, that kind of thing, um, to kind of keep a time capsule. But um, you tell me when to share. Okay. Oh, did you already um, close out of your PowerPoint? Yeah, I did. Okay. Oh, oh yeah. Don't worry about it. If you can't find it, that's okay. I, this is so funny. Do you have a picture um, up? I can just pull a picture up. Um, hold on a second. I think I can do this. <laughs> uh, I am. So, I am. I am going to learn this technology. I am going to learn this technology. Uh, it's like one of those things where. There we go. Uh, we oh, see, uh, oh, I know exactly what I did. Sorry. See, I didn't know Zoom four months ago. I'm I'm <laughs> I'm lear I am got all sorts of skills in my. Uh, sorry, guys. You've been with me all this time. So, okay. Ready. Uh, Yes, good. Do All it. Right. There we go. There it is. That's, the Newport. Okay, that's awesome. Mid-century yeah. modern architecture right there. Yeah, and the thing about it is Milwaukee really is that does. Still there right now? Huh? That's still, still there today? It is. Okay. Yep. I think it was like Milwaukee's first co-op. Okay. And it's still a cooperative. So, um, yeah, it's Russell Bar Williamson, you know, a uh, great architect. Um you know, it's just uh, Milwaukee really has some great mid-century buildings, and as much as a 19th-century enthusiast uh, that I am, I I really like championing uh, Milwaukee's mid-century as well. Sure, uh, because it's like mid-century architecture is such an easy thing to throw away, and yet it really is important and um, I, I can think of easily uh, a dozen mid-century buildings in Milwaukee that should have been preserved the way they were, and then get zapped sure. or remodeled because oh, it looks it looks too much like the '50s or '60s. So it's like sure. you know, it, it's the same thing that they were doing in the '30s and '40s. It's like this stuff needs to get out of here so we can do something else. So yeah. Well, one of the buildings you talked about was supposed to be a hotel, and they didn't want the neon sign out and, and right into efficiencies and i wonder if the character of the neighborhood would have been better preserved as a hotel rather than moving another apartment building in right exactly wow. yeah and the you know it's it's a whole thing about you know you think of what the density of prospect avenue was in the 1890s and then what it became you know uh kind of in the mid-century and you know the density just keeps increasing and they aren't making parking uh so <laughs> So public transit. I guess they're trying. They're trying. To figure out, right? I know. I know. So it's. Yeah. It, it, it is interesting, you know, and I think that uh, was one of the things I really enjoyed about uh, studying urban history is that there are these things that are just kind of happen in American cities. It's just it's a fascinating phenomenon. Cool. Well, hey, thanks a lot for talking tonight, John, and sharing your your uh, knowledge with us. Someday, I'm very appreciative. I'm very appreciative. Thank someday we'll have this awesome, with me. awesome book of yours to uh, push while we do one of these, right? Uh huh. Someday, uh -huh. yeah, you're like, yeah, someday. Yeah, yeah, I right. know. Yeah, exactly. I'm trying. I'm I'm trying to use this this downtime for us to, yeah. to really get some projects done. But. Sure. Well, cool. Well, um, 
thanks for hanging out with us, everybody else as well. Uh, for uh, yeah, in. thanks uh, everyone. So and uh, thank you, being with you. Uh, to the Paps Mansion for also partnering with us to uh, work on this event too. Um, so uh, next week we have one coming up on Thursday with the Jewish Museum of Milwaukee uh, talking about some of the Jewish artists in the town on Prospect Avenue. Yeah, there you are. Right, it's right. It all ties in. <laughs> Right. Uh, so uh, we'll be we'll be talking with the folks at the Jewish Museum of Milwaukee. And then in two weeks, we have one about Milwaukee's socialist past to tie in with our political exhibit that's going on right now, too. So uh, lots going on. Um, if you want to be part of the mailing list, um, then the best place to go is MilwaukeeHistory.net. And uh, you can find out about these well, well, well in advance. So, uh, John, have a good night. You too, John. Thank you. And everybody else, you take it easy.